All right, good day everybody. So basically in this video, I'll be presenting my Python mini project, um, which is RFID read display data, right? So this was an actual project of mine actually. So I stripped like, you know, most complex things about it. I'll just focus on the basics and that's the output for this Python mini project. So let me introduce myself. I'm Muhammad Nabil Al Shamirhan and this video is basically um, created to fulfill the requirements for introduction to Python programming subject. Let me walk through the content. So I have the first section describing introduction and problem statement and then followed by methodology and application workflows. And then I have the third section covering the application demo and finally discussion and conclusion. So let's go through the introduction and problem statement first hand. So I have a customer in which I will just name the customer as customer A. So customer A is using RFID tags applied on their products and an UHF ultra high frequency RFID reader gantry um, configured at the exit doorway to detect outbound items when they're shipping their products out to their retailers. Previously, prior to using RFID, they're tracking outbound items manually using an Excel sheet and just noting down the quantity as items are moving out. So if you look into, um, if you look towards the left side of my slide, um, I have a picture in the rounded icon over there. So that picture is an actual RFID gantry that we built um, for this customer of mine. So the problem statement would be customer A would like to have an application to interpret data coming from the RFID reader and this application must enable them to accept product data registration and RFID EPC details. Apart from accepting data registration and EPC details, the application must visually show RFID tax rate, quantity of those tags and the registration status in the case of missing product registration within the application. So for the methodology and application workflows, um, this application which will meet customer requirements is built using Python as a core programming language. So I am using Python a lot um, in my daily work actually. So this application runs as a web application and the RFID reader provides data through HTTP post and the format is JSON. The application should provide an API endpoint um, which was crafted using Python race framework that runs with HTTP as the protocol to ingest the JSON data coming from the reader. And I have a database, SQLite, which, uh, which works really well for small mini projects such as this. And this database will be configured to store product registration and EPC details. So EPC is actually electronic product code, you know, which is a unique identifier that we code on RFID tags and those identifiers are being read by RFID readers. Django, which is one of the Python web framework, is used to provide visual details to customer A with web sockets as intermediary data transport and relay. And finally, I'm using Python channels, which is used to accommodate web sockets and Redis to handle data cache are implemented with this application. So I'm using Python 3.9.11 for this project and I'm using these external Python modules, namely Django for the web framework channels to handle web socket, socket to have data transport, you know, using sockets, right? Sockets connection, TCP connections, and then JSON, right? To pass the data coming from the reader and finally web sockets and web socket client. And this is how the JSON data sample from RFID reader looks like. So I have the reader name, the MAC address, and also the tag reads. So if you look at the tag reads over here, I have the electronic product code, which is a unique identifier, consists of only digits. And I have the antenna port number and also the PIC RSSI values, the RF signal values that we use to filter whether tags are close or far away. The database model, since customer would like to have the product registration details within the application, so we need to have a database model for this. So I have EPC ID as the first column followed by serial number 
location, gantry ID, shipment number, purchase order number, item description, date of registration, and date updated. Um, this is how the database table looks like and the data types. So I'm using snake case for my naming conventions because that's, that works really well with Python and that is the best practice instead of Pascal case um, which, is, which is prominent um, to be used in Java, C Sharp, JavaScript. You know, most of the programming languages out there is using Pascal case but in Python we use snake case a lot. Um, words with underscores, words separated by underscores. On the application workflow side of things, the first and foremost I have item registration. So, you know, the customer will register the, the item and the application check if items exist via EPC. If EPC exists, then we generate warning error and we do not insert data into the database at all. Now, if EPC does not exist, we insert the data into database. Okay, so this is the call functionality of the application because we are ingesting RFID data coming from RFID readers. So when we have RFID data from the reader, the data is submitted to our API endpoint, which was crafted by, which is crafted using Python RACE framework. And we check for EPC existence in the database. If the EPC exists, we search for associated data with that EPC and we return the data coming from the database now, if we and the, if the EPC does not exist, we still show it visually to the customer. Only then we replace most of the columns with not found or registered. Now, for the WebSocket and the rendered view, um, so that the client can have a visual feeling, the customer can have a visual feeling of the data. We have a WebSocket server written in Python to receive data from API endpoint, and then we send the data to WebSocket URL. And then the WebSocket URL points to it channels and store the data in a cache server, in this case Redis. And then we forward the data into rendered web view and also a JavaScript table. And finally, we render the table out uh, and we are showing the tag counts as well. As for the application demo, if you look into my screen here, um, describing the two scenarios, the two basic scenarios which I'm handling in this mini project. So the first scenario would be what if an RFID tag data is not found or multiple RFID tags data um, are not found. So we still show it in front of the screen in the web browser. Only then most of the columns will be replaced with not found slash registered because the client would like to know what are the tags being read by the gantry. Now what if, if the RFID tag data is found then we show the customer um, what is actually stored in the database, you know, the data registered earlier so that the customer can know what, what are the things actually flowing through the RFID gantry. Alright, so I'm going to stop the video right here. I'm going to continue on with the application demo, so stay put with me. Okay, thanks for staying put with me. So basically, this is the application demo section of the video, right? So, for example, if, as you can see on the screen, this is the whole project actually written in Python, multiple Python files over there, right? And um, it makes use of the components that the external Python modules that I listed down previously in the slide. So, it, let me start with the database model. So, this is the database model, right? So, it is identical to that that you saw in the slide. Now, this database model corresponds to the EPC ID. Right, so whenever uh, the customer browse to the index page of the application, I have a URL over here, two URLs. Now the home URLs is to view the current status, the read status, and also the second URL to depict, you know, the API endpoint to ingest data coming from the RFID readers. So let me take you through to that RFID reader endpoint view. Now this endpoint actually is a post method, right? And I name it to as check for incoming data because we are checking whether EPC exists or not. So I initialize a tag dictionary, which is an empty dictionary as a variable first. And then I take in the request.data coming from the reader because each of the data transmission from the reader is actually a HTTP request, a post request, right? So then, 
for every tag read in data tag reads if you recall the json data structure that i presented in the slides before um, we have multiple tag epc reads which is very common with rfid readers right we are reading multiple tags at one go so i have a try and accept block here you know to check whether tag exists or not so i have a tag object um, which connects back to the database model to pull the EPC data out and it takes in EPC ID as the argument, right? And if tag object exists, if the EPC data exists, then I would simply call out all the related columns with that EPC ID and reconstruct the JSON data back. I have an exception over here. If the RFID tag data does not exist, then I would replace most of the columns over here with not found slash not registered. And then I would update the tag dictionary with the reconstructed data. You can see both variables over here, right? Because both of them correspond to whether the data is found or not from the database. And then I would push the data to a web socket and I will return the response back to the reader with HTTP status to 100. Now let's take a look at the web socket code. So I use socket for this one. I define a function, right, which takes in tag data argument, you know, the data that you saw before, right? So if you take a look here, it takes a tag dictionary actually. Now this web socket, I specify the host and the port number, which is the web socket server. And I have a variable tag socket here and I do a JSON dumps because I want to sustain the integrity of JSON data structures across. So that's why I did a JSON dumps and I encode it in UTF-8, which is a common encoding for web sockets and socket connections. And then I initialize the socket to connect to the host and port number, send all the data and finally close the socket, right? Okay, so take, let's take a look at the socket server. So I have a socket server written um, in Python as well, because all of this, all of this project is written in Python. There's no other languages except for the front end because we use JavaScript, right? I use JavaScript to handle some of the data views because Python is not really a front end language. Python is a back end language, right? So all that you see over here is all the back end. I'll show you the front end in a short while, though that does not really matter for this course actually, because this course is driven um, towards Python more and and if you look into my socket server over here, I have socket, web socket, and JSON. I'm listening to a particular port in my station, in my PC here. I have a get message function, which takes in, which specify message as a variable. And I have 4096 data bytes and decoding that and then returning back the message. So I'm binding the socket to my host and port number specified over here. So I'm printing the status so that I would know uh, whether it works or not and I have two while true loops because if it's true then I need to accept the connection for the address and I need to know whether I'm connected or not right and then if it's true again if the data is coming in then I would get the message if the message is empty I would break the loop right if the message is not empty then I'll just proceed forward to send back to the web socket listening at the front end so I would connect to this WebSocket URL, which is handled by Django slash Python slash channels. And I would send all the JSON dumps over and I would close the connection finally, because as sockets, we cannot retain the connectivity of a socket for such a long time because you tend to have a memory leak when you do so. Now let's take a look at the channels code, which is quite interesting for this project. Um, if I head over to this routing file over here, I have my socket pattern actually, which is a URL, a web socket URL. So I have a consumer file specified and I have an RFID intake data function. So let's take a look at that. So for this RFID intake data, now as you can see, channels is asynchronous. It is asynchronous Python. You know, most of the code that you see um, that you've dealt with are all synchronous. You know, one job has to complete before the other continues, right? But in asynchronous, multiple jobs are running together. So we use that a lot in production apps. We use that a lot in the applications in the real world. So I have a connect function, 
right? Which is an asynchronous Python function. And then I have a group name specified because this connects back to my radius. So I would add the group data, right? And I will wait for the connections to come in. Now, if the connection got disconnected, I'll just do a pass unless I wanted to do some other actions. But for the context of this project, I'm not doing any other actions. And then if I'm receiving the data, then I would just simply transform the data, load it back um, in JSON format, JSON lots, and finally relaying it to the front end. Okay, so in the front end, I won't go so much on the front end actually. Front end is all HTML. Um, I have a simple JavaScript here to connect back to the WebSocket URL and you know showing an alert if connection is established and all the functions here are JavaScript because Python is not really a front end language. So what happens is that a JSON data is coming over then I would interpret that data and show it over here because I am creating a table, right? I'm inserting the cells and all the cells are actually corresponding to data element and key which is standard dictionary processing. All right. Okay, so I'll show you the practical way of how the application is working. So I'm going to start the first thing first. I'm going to start the server, right? So I'm listening on my IP address port 1011. So that's for Django. And then I'll have my socket server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do Python. socket server.py and it's bound to my port number and also the IP address of my station and I have the application open here so I'm going to refresh the screen right so connection is established which is good and I have the sample data right here okay in which this data does not exist in the database so I'm going to send this stack data, I have a response back, data receive, and I can see the data on the screen right now. So I'm not, refre I'm not refreshing the page. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to do it this way so that you can have a better look at it. Okay, so if I send a data which exists in the database, And you can see that the screen changes straight away, right? Without any intervention. I do not have to refresh the screen as well. So um, registering attack data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take, uh, sorry, I'm going to take attack data over here because all of these are not found or registered. And I am going to register one of this. Let's register attack number two. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to go to the admin page that I have created. Okay, so I'm going to add an RFID tag. So I'm just going to copy paste this, right? And I'm going to change the string number is number two. Location is the same, gantry is the same, shipment number to number two, purchase order number to number two, and I will put some item to be shipped. And I'll do a save, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send this data back, okay? I'm going to send this data back, and you can see that one of this tag, which I, which I registered before, is now registered, and you can see all the associated information with it, okay? So... Um, apart from that, uh, if I try to add the data again, let's try to add the data again um, using a different serial number, for example, because EPC has to be unique, right? So I'm going to put shipment number as number three, purchase order number as number three as well. Some item to be shipped tomorrow. And do a save, and you can see that RFID tag data with this EPC ID already exists. Right, so I'm catching the. Um, I am actually handling the potential. You know, I am actually handling the situation where we do not have to. We do not need to have any duplicate data in the database at all, which is quite disastrous in production applications. 
All right. Returning back to the presentation where I'm going to explain about the discussion and conclusion parts of this presentation. So if we look into the application demos, um, the introduction to the mini project, right? So this, the, the application built in this mini project exhibits many benefits on using Python to build production ready business oriented applications or any other applications to solve real world problems. And these benefits include wide libraries supporting application develop using Python. You have flexibility between scripting and object oriented development. If you take a look at my web page code, at my web application code, the REST API code, um, you can see that most of the codes there are actually object oriented, especially when we call database models, right? So, and then I have the socket server. It's just a simple Python script. So I have the flexibility to move around between the two, actually. And I have better code readability for other developers to continue feature developments, which is, um, which is beneficial when you're, when you're doing open source projects. And multi-platform development, as you can see, Python is not just you know building desktop apps. You can use you can you can build web sockets, you can build um, REST APIs, you can build web uh, web pages, right? Anything that you can creatively think of. And of course, we have huge support from Python community, and it is scalable, sustainable to maintain. It has the lowest vulnerability index compared with other programming languages as well, because most of the hackers today in this world write um, hijack codes or you know um, injection codes in Python. So you know codes they are being used to hijack or you know to intercept or even to interject or even to inject, right? All these codes are written in Python today. And the best part of writing applications in Python, you can anticipate what the hackers would write. So that's why I'm handling exceptions because those are loopholes basically for the hackers out there. And it has a lowest vulnerability index compared to any other programming languages that I've done before such as Java, C, um, and it's getting updated almost weekly, right? For the security patches. And of course, Python is focused on accelerated developments for those who like accelerated developments such as mine. And as for the conclusion, by building this mini project, it is with absolute certainty that I can mention that I have grabs the concept available within Python programming, which is the primary objective of this course. And Python being the fastest growing programming language globally enables an individual to learn how to code rapidly with understanding as the codes are easily readable compared with other programming languages. This is the only language which is human friendly um, from my years of experience in programming. So um, with that, I end my video. Um, thanks for watching. So I hope you learned something from my video. Thank you.